Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Matt Oline. And I'm Barb Gravel. On this edition of Prairie Mosaic, we'll profile author Denise Lajmadir, learn more about Theodore Roosevelt, see an excerpt from our documentary, Women Behind the Plow, and listen to the music of the John Peterson Jazz Quintet. While we may take it for granted today, electricity and power in rural Minnesota were not always reliable. A new traveling exhibit at the Becker County Museum in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, looks at the long history of electrifying Minnesota. This is the traveling exhibit from the Minnesota Historical Society, and this is Electrifying Minnesota. In the exhibit, it talks about the history of our utility and what our utility has done for the community that owns their own utility, how they control their destiny when it comes to building power lines, building power plants, building distribution systems, and being engaged in the process to bring power to the rural areas. We provide a lot of historical material and equipment that's inside the historical museum here. We've got some pictures of our old generation facility from back in the early 1900s to the 1950s. And a lot of the old hardware we use, some of the tools that were used in the early days. And we just want to be a big partner with the historical society and tell our history about the public utilities here in Detroit Lakes. It's pretty storied and rich history. As it happens with a lot of our traveling exhibits and exhibits that we put up here, as soon as people heard that we were having an electrical exhibit, people started just showing up with things. We have added in some Becker County elements to this, so we have our local element. We have a lot of telephones and we have an early switchboard from our area that we've put on display as well. There is also an interactive component to this exhibit. So we've brought in snap circuits and generators that people can learn how generators work on a smaller scale. There's a lot of information about where our power comes from right here in Becker County and throughout the state of Minnesota. Within Detroit Lakes, 1891 was the first year when EG Home started its first small generation plant. That's when electricity came to Detroit Lakes. The surrounding areas significantly after that, with the Rural Electrification Act in the 1940s and the start of the cooperatives. Communities about the size of Detroit Lakes, where they had interested people to bring generation in and start their own generation facilities, did that. A lot of other communities around us did the same thing, but we were islands. None of this was tied together. There were no transmission facilities at the time. Water tail power provided electricity in Fergus Falls. The local utility provided in Detroit Lakes and some of the surrounding lakes areas. And then after that, it would have been in the 30s when the Electrification Act started, and they started doing electrification in rural Minnesota. And then that even took on until into the late 1950s before a lot of areas in rural Minnesota became electrified. We're all parents here at the museum, and we know that kids like to learn by touching things. So we always make sure that there's lots of interactive activities for kids and families. They're playing while they're learning, but hopefully they're taking these little tidbits home as knowledge. In the mid-1970s, there was a controversial power line project scheduled to go through central Minnesota. It was bringing energy from a coal-fired power plant in Underwood, North Dakota, and taking it to a power station just outside of Buffalo, Minnesota. It was a very high voltage, large project. They wanted to run power lines through people's land that they were using as farmland. They were making a living off that land, and all of a sudden, the state wanted to take that land away from them and put power lines through. Power companies proceeded, and when the construction crew started, 
the farmer said, we've had enough. We're not going to put up with this. We're not going to let you build the power line. It got very, very contentious between the farmers and the construction crews. So I started in 1970 as a groundman and a security guard working nights to protect the construction equipment from the people who were protesting the lines. Both the utility companies and people, property owners now understand there's a better way to navigate through building power lines. Take a look at some of the tools and equipment used by the line crews back in the day and think about the evolution of the line crew when they climbed everything by climbers and belts and hooks, we call them, to the bucket trucks we use today. We did learn that there were a lot of line women as well. There's some information on our panels about the women who were forefront in getting the power to our area. Oh, how far has electricity come? A long ways. If you think about the early generation facilities where we used coal as a heat source, now we're using renewable energy to bring power to the community of Detroit Lakes. And that's an exciting time to be involved with the change and evolution of our power supply. It's come a long ways in the last 100 years, and it's going to be amazing what it does in the next 20 or 25 years. Author Denise Lajmadir's academic book, Stringing Rosaries, delves deep into the unsettling history of American Indian boarding schools, including the abuse and trauma that continues to affect survivors' families yet today. My choice for punishment was either a razor strap or a fiberglass fishing pole. He gave me a choice, so I took the fiberglass fishing pole. What happened is these kids would go and listen when they knew someone was going in room 19. They'd all gather around the corner and listen by this grill to find out how long it would take for you to start screaming your head off. So I wanted to see why you went to boarding school, what you went through at boarding school, and what your life was like now, without my voice interrupting. Just told stories, so these are all their stories in their own words. The title of my academic book is Stringing Rosaries. When I was uh, doing my qualitative study for my dissertation, I interviewed Native American uh, females who were the first ever females in their position of leadership. And in their stories, most of them had been boarding schooled or were talking about boarding schools or had parents that were boarding schooled. I began interviewing survivors. Uh, with a, an interview protocol that came from the National Boarding School uh, Healing Coalition. So many of the survivors did not want me to publish their names, but they just said, tell the world our story. Tell the world what happened to us. Many, many generations of our kids were taken from homes, forcibly taken from homes, and sent to boarding schools. My father was sent to boarding school when he was nine years old. He was taken from here uh, to a mountain reservation, pretty much stolen when he was nine and sent three days and three nights on a train to Chamawa. He had never learned throughout his entire life about the government's assimilation policy, why he was stolen, why his hair was shaved off, and why he was beaten for speaking Cree and Christianity forced on him. This was his soul wound. Richard Pratt, who started the first off-reservation boarding school, Carlisle, in 1879. He liked Indians, but he hated the culture, the ceremony, the language, the traditions. So he wanted to kill the Indian and save the man. He was a military man, so they were run uh, with military precision, along with the corporal punishment, severe beatings. My father, my mother, um, grandparents, they weren't allowed to speak their tribal language. If you got caught speaking your tongue, the nuns or the, the people in the dorm or the teachers, I guess, they would have lye soap and put that in your mouth and then hold your mouth shut until you either blew bubbles or you got blisters in your, in your mouth. So that's how he learned how to speak English. Everything that was Indian was beaten out of them, was shamed out of them to make them as uh, white citizens, as white as, as they could. So when these kids went back to home, to the reservations, I called them the returned. They didn't fit in. They didn't know their parents. Some of them were gone for up to 12 years. The suggested stay was a minimum of four years. So it was a very hard adjustment back. 
My research over the past 10 years has come up with uh, almost 400 boarding schools in the United States, in 29 states. It's very tedious work. I would find a boarding school document and then in there they would list other boarding schools so then I'd go off and, and search for those boarding schools. So have I found all the boarding schools? Absolutely not. There's still people that send me boarding schools or uh, I'm reading on Facebook even and someone will say, oh my grandfather went to boarding school and it'll be in Alaska and I'll check my list and I, I won't have it. And then I'll Google it and, and sure enough it'll show up. The stories that you read in the book are of extreme loneliness. Lonesome at night, you could hear it. You could hear the little boys kind of sniffing and they were trying not to cry loud because you got punished for that. Why am I here? Some of them were stolen, some of them were sent, some of them because their parents weren't able to function. Uh, and that's a whole other sad story there is what was going on in reservations, reservation life with adjusting from being people free on the prairies to being put on reservations and then uh, our way of uh, living, our hunting and fishing and so on was taken away, uh, dependent on commodity foods and so on, the illnesses and the alcoholism and the suicide. That's the legacy. It's called intergenerational trauma or historical trauma that our people are suffering now um, due to the boarding school era. Theodore Roosevelt accomplished many things during his time as 26th U.S. President, one of them being the creation of the first federal bird refuge in Pelican Island, Florida in 1903. Here's a look. Remembering Theodore Roosevelt, featuring the words of Roosevelt as read by Steve Stark. In March of 1903, President Roosevelt created America's first federal bird refuge. Pelican Island, Florida had long been a favorite haven for beautiful shore and wading birds where mangroves hugged the waters of the small island. Pelicans, peafowls, flamingos, and spoonbills adorned the beach. Victorian ladies' hats also vied for the birds' beautiful adornments. The plumage was highly sought after in the name of elegance and fashion. Consequently, the birds were being killed by the tens of thousands to fulfill those vanities. During his time in office, Roosevelt had created 51 federal bird reservations, four national game preserves, 150 national forests, and many more conservation projects that we take for granted today. Birds that are useless for the table and not harmful to the farm should always be preserved. And the more beautiful they are, the more carefully they should be preserved. They look a great deal better in the swamps and on the beaches and among the trees than they do on hats. As yet, with the great majority of our most interesting and important wild birds and beasts, the prime need is to protect them, not only by laws limiting the open season and the size of the individual bag, but especially by the creation of sanctuaries and refuges. The progress made in the United States of recent years in creating and policing bird refuges has been of capital importance. Laws to protect small and harmless wildlife, especially birds, are indispensable. The love of the land and lifestyle run deep in the blood of a farm family. Katie Joe and Don Horner share their story in this excerpt from Prairie Public's documentary, Women Behind the Plow. Growing up as a young girl on the farm, I was with my dad at his side at all times. If he was in the field mowing hay, I was in the field mowing hay. We were together all the time. I think I stayed in farming because it was my dad who, who uh, pushed me and made me feel it was just part of my background. I started working with dad, boy, when I was young. I was probably seven or eight going out and helping him. My biggest thing was always the cows. 
the baby calves, that was always the highlight. After I got married and I moved to this farm with my husband, I wanted that agricultural background in me to come out in me more. And I do help a lot on the farm. I do want this agriculture business to continue. I treat my kids as I was treated growing up. I push the farming aspect quite a bit. My husband does too. He was very active in FFA. I was active in 4-H. So you put them two together, you're going to try to push your kids. I never cooked with my mom, and I hate cooking now. <laughs> I don't like it. I would rather be outside working with the cows, doing anything outside related that I don't have to come in and cook. My favorite season on farm is calving. It always has been. Watching a cow give birth to a newborn calf. The birthing part of it is just amazing that you can transform that and you can go from zero one day to 500 in a month <laughs> and have a lot of them running around. When you put them out to pasture, you look for them when you make sure they're doing good. But you do always have the tribulations of losing some and I take it really hard when we do lose some, but it's part of life. You can't save them all. You try, you try. Having three daughters, I'm really excited that one of them did go into the agricultural business. That was kind of a shock to me that she wanted to go to college and do that. And I'm glad she did. I'm so glad she did. I just graduated college in April and I am back on the farm where I help my dad out. And I also took a job in Napoleon as a bookkeeper at a law firm where I work 20 hours right now there a week. And I also sell Ray hybrid seeds on the side. When I started growing up, I was with my dad and my grandpa a lot. Being the oldest of the family, I was always outside and my family likes to push agriculture, so we were never really in the house sitting around or watching TV where there's always something to do. And my dad started pushing me to work on equipment and work more outside, which threw me to the farming aspect. And my getting up where I'm 19 now, my grandpas are starting to retire and they're the ones that asked me before I graduated high school, if you're really gonna go into this, we'd like to talk and try to help you out if you wanna stick with agriculture. And that's what drove me the most. I never really was interested in anything else in high school, more driven towards the farming aspect or the bookkeeping aspect of it. The assets that have to be put into farming, I don't know if I see myself by myself, either future, I see myself staying with my dad and possibly marrying a farmer myself to start our own family on our farm and push farming. But I do definitely see me staying with my dad, working with my dad, sharing equipment. So that way I don't have to take all the assets on myself. We can just help each other back and forth. The number one technology thing that gets used the most on the farm is our cell phones. If you break down or if you need something, you call right away. You don't go run after them to find them. The other farming thing that we use the most is GPS and the tractors. That gets used in every single tractor we have. Every equipment, it all gets used GPS. It's the simplest thing to do. I can't imagine not using GPS back in the days. I do like cows a lot. I have about 40 cows of my own, so I'm out there a lot with the cows. My mom is a lot more into calving than I am. We take shifts checking cattle. I'll do the night shifts and my parents do during the day shifts but I'm definitely out there helping if anything goes wrong or if we need help with a calf or feeding. I feed every morning with my dad. When I was thinking about my future, I want to farm, but if I get married to a farmer, obviously times are tough right now and you aren't both gonna make it farming strictly. So coming back to Napoleon, there are some places you could get jobs as an accountant and I was just happy enough to find one. So I just kind of stepped my foot into there and hopefully it keeps growing from there. The John Peterson Jazz Quintet is a top-notch group consisting of some of the best musicians in the Fargo-Moorhead area. Here's a selection from John Peterson and his musical colleagues. Hello, I'm John Peterson and I'm the leader of the John Peterson Jazz Quintet. I put the group together about five years ago as I have a great love for jazz and improvisation, which is so different from any other kind of music that you have to play. Jazz offers you the chance to improvise and make up the melodies as you go along based on chord changes. 
And so I put together some of the finest musicians that I could find in the FM area. One of the missions of myself is to preserve jazz in the Fargo-Moorhead area and keep it alive and keep it vital. It's one of America's only original forms of music that is played worldwide. And it's something that has been a passion of mine, and it's something that I want to let students hear what the older folks have transcended down through all of the generations and play different styles of jazz so that everyone can hear how varied that jazz can be. And it's something that um, has been a real passion and one of the things that keeps me alive and keeps me going in my retirement after 32 years of band directing.
If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at prairiemosaic at prairiepublic.org. You can watch this and other episodes of Prairie Mosaic on Prairie Public's YouTube channel and follow Prairie Public on social media as well. I'm Matt Oline. And I'm Barb Gravel. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.